Well, welcome to Kairos. My name is Mike. It is so good to see you here tonight. Um, if you've got a copy of the scriptures, why don't you turn with me to Luke chapter 6. We're continuing to talk about community here at Kairos. And community is something that's changed my life. Probably the best small group, best community group I've been a part of was the first one I led. Um, now, it doesn't mean that I have a favorite, although that was probably my favorite one. Um, and uh, let me just tell you, I've had great experiences in the community and some really bad ones. It's bad when you're the leader and you don't want to go. I've had that happen. You're like, I'm leading this thing. I don't want to go either. Um, sometimes community can be a place that's just awkward. Sometimes it can be some of the most life-giving moments of your life. And for me, that first small group was incredibly life-giving. The guys that were in that group uh, that I led uh, have been in my life for a long time. You know, sometimes you have these core relationships, these people that are your ride or dies. Those guys have been that for me. Uh, but it wasn't like that in the beginning. So the first time I started that group, I decided I was going to start a group because community is a choice. And I said, I'm going to start this group. And I asked my roommates and some of my friends to be in that group. Uh, we were all single. We were all in our early 20s. So I said, hey, come be a part of this group. And then I had my pastor say, hey, why don't you think about inviting a couple other people into that group that are not in your group, make some space for some other people, which was kind of threatening because I was like, then I don't have control over who's in this group. It's pretty stacked. I like all the people in it right now. We may have some weirdos. So I don't want to do that. So I was like, okay, okay, I'll do it. I'll, I'll open up my, my life to some people I don't know. So I invited some people in that I didn't know, some friends of friends. And then I met two people on one Sunday morning that joined the group. Uh, their names were Stephen and Kelly. I never met them before in my life. And Kelly, that's a, that's a boy's name in this case, okay? His name is Kelly. And uh, I, I was thinking when I met them, I was like, please don't be a, a serial killer. That's like literally all I was thinking. I was like, please just be normal. Please don't, don't make this like an unsafe place for me relationally. I just want this to be awesome. And what I found was as I continued to get to know those guys is that they became huge parts of my life. In fact, some of my very best friends. They, they moved from being strangers to being family. Uh, I was in Kelly's wedding. Kelly was in mine. I did Stephen's wedding, which, by the way, I messed up his wedding vows so bad. You guys want to hear what I did? So it was like one of my first weddings I ever did. Stephen asked me to do his wedding. So uh, Stephen's family uh, has some resources that some of the rest of us don't. Uh, but he uh, had a, this, uh, this party uh, right before his wedding on a big yacht in Gulf Shores, and then they had the wedding at a private island. So we came out there, and I'm like kind of feeling it. I was like, wow, we're like rolling deep here with these people, hanging out with people like, you know, run trust funds, that kind of stuff. And so I'm doing the wedding on this dock. It's sunset. It's beautiful. The bride comes down. She's beautiful. My buddy Steven, like he's just like just beaming. They're so excited. They're so in love. And I'm doing the vows, and I said the wrong thing. This is what I said. I said, you know, you're kind of going through the vows. You're like, hey, you know, they have to hold you. Uh, in sickness and health, for richer, for poorer. But guess what I said? I said, for richer, for richer. <laughs> I, I literally was like, for richer, for richer. And the bride was saying them, and she just like rolled right with it. She's like, yes, for richer, for richer. I was like, okay, okay, okay. And let's, let's go that way. And, he, and, and just kind of as an update, he just bought a jet recently, so I think it worked out. Um, but uh, community is, is a choice. It's a choice to be in community. And we're going to be talking about that tonight. Uh, and, and community enriches our life and transforms us at our very core. The friendships that we make in community make us or break us. And so I thought it would be good for us to look at the very first Christian community, the one that Jesus started, okay? Because if anybody has an idea about great community, it's Jesus. We should look at him. So in Acts, I'm sorry, in uh, Luke chapter 6, we're going to see the very first group, the very first group of people that were literally following Jesus as Jesus names his disciples. I'm going to read the text to you, and then we'll unpack it here in our time that we have left. So it says this, During those days, he, which is Jesus, he went out to the mountain to pray and spent all night in prayer to God. When daylight came, he summoned his disciples and he chose 12 of them, whom he also named apostles. Simon whom he also named Peter, and Andrew his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, 
John the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called the Zealot, Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Now, here's what I know about this passage. A lot of us uh, don't really know the disciples' names. That, that's me. Like, if uh, you asked me just on a random, like, Wednesday before I was preparing this, be like, hey, name the disciples, I would really struggle in doing that. Okay, I'm a pastor with a PhD. Like, it's hard to remember the names. And part of it is because um, we know the big, you know, four. Like, we're like, okay, we know Peter, James, John, and Judas. Like, those are the four that we know, right? And maybe Matthew, and if we watch The Chosen, we can maybe name a couple extra, right? But really, we don't know who they are. And part of that is because the Bible doesn't talk about a lot of them in depth. Like Bartholomew, only thing we know about him from the Bible is that he hung out with Jesus and that his name is listed four times. That's it, okay? And yet, here's the deal. When we look at this passage, we find some incredible insight into community and into groups. So here's the first thing I want you guys to consider. When it comes to choosing community, Jesus chose the unchosen. He chose the unchosen. And what I want you to look here as Jesus does this choosing. He takes time to pray over the disciples. He goes up to a mountain. He prays all night long. Like no naps in the middle of this praying. He prays all night long, comes down, gathers all of his disciples. So it's not just 12 people following him at this time. There's this crowd of people who are like, yeah, I'm following you, Jesus. I'm in. I'm part of the core. I'm doing this. And then Jesus chose out of those people 12 specific individuals to be his apostles. Now, he chose the unchosen. And what I mean by that is that every single one of these guys had experienced rejection spiritually. So sometimes we miss this part. Every single one of these men had grown up in a rabbinic school where they were hoping that they could become a Jewish scholar. So from early childhood, instead of going to like elementary school, right? Instead of like learning their ABCs and those things, they learned that, but also they learned the law. And the Pharisees and rabbis would be watching them and trying to find out who had talent and skills so that they could join the elite. And along the way, every single one of them was told, you're not good enough, you need to leave. Hey, maybe like being a fisherman would be a better thing for you to do. Or maybe you should be a carpenter or maybe you should go back home. All of them were told that they had not been chosen. Can you imagine what that felt like? Hey, you're not good enough. You can't make it. You're not spiritual enough. You're not smart enough. You can't memorize scripture enough. You're not in. Some of you actually know what that feels like because you're feeling it right now. You're feeling rejection. Somebody has like broken up with you. Like, hey, you're not the one. And even though you're like glad you're not going to go further, it still hurts, right? Some of you may feel rejection in church. You put your name out there. You're like, hey, I want to join the band. And they're like, they just never got back to you, right? You're like, man, this really stinks. We know how that is. Nashville's a tough place musically, isn't it? Maybe you started doing ministry at one point. I know there are a lot of young people in the city who had dreams of being in vocational ministry. And you're like, man, I'm going to be the next Billy Graham. Because I thought that. Like, I was like, it's going to be me, right? Preaching, revival tents. It's going to be the whole thing. Didn't happen. You may feel the same way. You might be like, man, listen, I've got plans of how God is going to use me. And it's not happening right now. You may feel like you're... Not making the cut, but Jesus chose the unchosen. That's what he did. He chose people that had been pushed aside. People who went back to fishing and carpentry. And Jesus said, come and follow me. And what he did when he did that, he did something that was completely out of step for every single rabbi in Israel. See, what would happen if you wanted to be a scholar is that you had to choose your teacher and get them to choose you. So what you had to do is you had to choose them and then get them to accept you as a student. But it was the students trying to attract the master, trying to get the master's favor, choosing that master and pursuing them. But Jesus says, you don't have to perform to be in all you have to do is accept my invitation Jesus turns the tables Jesus chooses them he says follow me because community is a choice and when he calls them to follow him he names them 
He gives them a name. He calls them apostles. He doesn't just say, hey, you're Talmudim, which were people who would follow along with their rabbi. He designated them for a different calling, and he chose the unchosen. Here's the deal I want you to hear tonight. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what's happening in your life. I don't know if you're dealing with mental health or depression or pain or sorrow. I don't know what you're going through, but Jesus does, and he's choosing you. He wants to do something through your story, and he wants to give you a new name. It's not the name that someone gave you when they said you're not good enough or you're not, not involved or you, you don't have the right skills. Jesus has something better for you. The best thing that happened to these 12 was that they were not chosen, that they were not in the rabbinic schools. Why? Because if they had been there, they never would have known Jesus. If they had been chosen, they would never have been chosen by the right teacher. And they would never have been in. So you may feel deeply discouraged tonight. Just know, this is part of God's plan for your life. He has something far better for you. And if you see what he has for you, you will find it. Now the second thing I want you guys to see here is that community is a choice. And we have to choose community and we have to choose it over consumerism. Okay, so here's the deal. Like Nashville's filled with a lot of great churches, right? I mean, you can go from church to church, young adult Bible study, young adult Bible study, and you can be like, this guy's got a better teaching style, this, this person's a better worship leader, these people are cool, these people are like funny, these people are nice. You know, like we have like an embarrassment of riches in Nashville. Let's be honest, right? We got a world-class church of every kind. We like, you like Church of Christ churches? We got the best one in the country, right? You want a Church of Christ church that's got like cool music? We actually have that too, right? We have, we have Baptist churches that are like high church, low church. We've got cool like, like Catholic churches. We've got uh, charismatic churches. We've got like Australian churches. Like we've got all kinds of churches in the city. And it's easy to simply consume, but community is choosing to reject consumerism and choosing to give. And that's what Jesus does. He brings a different kind of community to these men that they've never experienced. So I thought it would be helpful to kind of go through their names. Okay. So here's the deal. Like, honestly, when you hear these names, I kind of glaze over. So I'm going to do a visual thing here for us to help us understand a little bit what's going on with the disciples. Okay. So the first thing you find is Jesus. Everything starts with him. We're always only about Jesus. But Jesus didn't live in a vacuum. So Jesus... As you know, if you've been paying attention at all, had parents, right? So he had Mary. I'm actually going to write these out. And Joseph. Joseph was his adopted father. Um, we don't know what happens to Joseph. At some point, Joseph appears to have passed away. When Jesus begins to teach, he's no longer on the scene. Um, but of Jesus' disciples, some of them are related to him. So Mary has a sister, and um, her name is Salome. And she has two sons. She's married to Zebedee. And her sons are pretty famous, right? James and John. We know who they are. Um, there's another James. The word James comes around a lot. Um, Jesus actually has some half-brothers. Uh, one of them is James, uh, who does not believe in Jesus at first. Um, later gets saved when he meets Jesus after Jesus is resurrected. Which, by the way, is something that's fascinating, right? So Jesus uh, has his brothers who did who uh, do not believe in him. He's got James and Jude. Both of them were like, yeah, I'm not sure if Jesus is the son of God like you would with your brother or sister, right? Like what would it take for you to believe your son? I'm sorry, your brother or sister was the son of God? Like resurrection's probably it, right? Jesus shows up and is like, boo, I'm back. And at that point they convert. But at first, both these guys are not willing to follow Jesus. In fact, they're afraid that he's bringing shame to their family. They show up and say, hey, we're going to take you home to, to stop teaching, stop doing these miracles. Like, this can't be real that you're God. So they're out at first. But John and James, his cousins, are in. They follow Jesus. Then you have Peter and Andrew, who are brothers. Can you guys see this? I think we are eye magging it, so hopefully you can see it. So we've got Peter and Andrew. They're brothers. They're fishermen. Peter, his first name is Simon. Jesus renames him Peter. Peter basically just means Rocky. So, like, that's his nickname. Jesus gives him. Jesus got a sense of humor, apparently. Uh, but that's him. Then there's some others that we don't really, like, talk about a lot. But we have Bartholomew. Again, we only see him. Bartholomew. Okay. 
no pressure in front of all these few people. Uh, Bartholomew, we have Philip, who's kind of the first person who sees Jesus after he's baptized. And he's like, hey, there he is. Uh, we have Thomas, who, um, as you guys may have heard, he doubted at one point. But the first time we see Thomas, he's like, hey, let's just go and die for Jesus. So he's actually somebody who really believes strongly in Jesus. We have Judas, the bad guy. Um, Judas Iscariot, that's not his last name, by the way. Judas Iscariot, Iscariot means that that's the town that he's from. Uh, and then we have Matthew, who's a tax collector. So these five kind of key guys don't know a lot about them. We know more about Judas and Matthew and Thomas, but Philip and Bartholomew kind of like kind of background guys. Uh, and then there's uh, a couple others that I want to talk about. So Joseph has a brother um, named Cleopas, but they also call him uh, Alphaeus, which you find him here in this name. Alphaeus is his other name. That's what they I guess we'd call him in another language. Uh, but uh, he's got three sons. And these sons are fascinating, okay? His three sons are uh, James. They call him James the Little because apparently he's short. This James, big. This James, tiny. So they call him James the Little. You have the other Judas, which I, I love this. Like, he's like, not that one. Like, I'm the other Judas, like the rest of his life. <laughs> in fact, ends up changing his name later because he's like, uh, Judas got like the worst name ever, so I'm not going to be called that anymore. I'm going to be called Nathaniel, which means praise. What would you call yourself? You call yourself Judas? No, change that in a minute. And then they have Simon the Zealot. And it seems that these three are brothers, or that Judas at least is like the son of James, because he called him the son of James. So these three are like, are like sort of cousins of Jesus. And so what I find here fascinating is a couple of observations about these brothers. First of all, is that Jesus chose people that were in his orbit. Sometimes we think Jesus showed up and he's like, boo. And everybody's like, wow, okay, I've never seen you before. But it seems that at least these guys, John, James, the other James, Judas and Simon, the zealot, these guys knew him probably when he was a kid. And yet they're like, yes, we're still going to follow Jesus. In fact, we find Cleopas, who's married to a lady named Mary, Cleopas, this is like the other Mary. It's not Mary Magdalene. There's three Marys. Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary, this one goes to the, te- uh, to the, the tomb with them. All of these people hang out with Jesus all the time. Because he looks at the people who are closest to him when he says, I'm going to walk with you. Sometimes when we look at community, we can become consumers because we're looking at people who we don't know to fill our needs. And to fill community. But if we want to be in deep community with people, sometimes we need to look at the people who are already close to us. Like James and John and the other James and Judas and Simon. Jesus says, I want you to come follow me. But community can also be a choice because it can be very difficult. Because Jesus unites people who have nothing else in common. So I just want to point something out. This guy, Simon the Zealot. The reason they call him the zealot is because he was a part of a group that was trying to take over the country and restore it. They were like, let's make Israel great again. He's like the original crew that's trying to do that, okay? That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to restore Israeli rule, not the Romans. And Jesus is like, hey, we're going to have you here. We're going to have the complete opposite. We're going to have a Matthew who's a tax collector who's actually collaborating with the Romans. And I'm going to ask you guys to be brothers. Isn't that messy? Can you imagine what those conversations were like? The beauty of Christianity is that God unites people who have nothing else in common. The other day, my wife and I uh, took our oldest daughter to New York City. It was her 11th birthday. We're like, hey, let's go do something fun before you hate us and go to middle school. Right? So we were literally like, all right, let's go do something fun for her birthday. We said, pick anywhere in America that we can use Southwest points for. So she chose New York City. So we went. We went to Wicked. We went and did a bunch of other fun stuff. We like walked the Brooklyn Bridge. It was awesome. Like I completely encourage you to go to New York City someday. But uh, when we were on our way to the airport, our Uber driver was playing Christian music in the Uber. And I was like, oh. If you ever done that, you see somebody you don't know that they like, they like, they like play Christian music or they got like some kind of like Christian symbol and you start going, I and so you start like trying to find ways to like to like bond with them. Have you ever done that? Is that just me? 
who started going like, hey, so you like that music? Like literally, like, that's what I asked. I was like, is this, a, he was like, yeah, Christian music. And I was like thinking about it. I almost went for it. I was like, I'm also a Christian. Let's play our Christian cards. Let's see, you know, like I didn't do that because I was like, I, I, I don't know why. I think I was just not in the mood that day. But like there's this thing where you're just like, man, this person also made love Jesus. And I was thinking about that interaction because here's the deal. If he was a Christian, which I think he was, there was nothing that we had in common. He was an immigrant from Africa. He lived in New York City. We live in Nashville. I don't know anything about his family or his socioeconomic status, but I do know one thing about him. We both claim the name of Jesus. And if we do, then I have more in common with him than my blood brother. Because Jesus changes who we are at a fundamental level. So how can we possibly be consumers when that's the standard that Jesus invites us to? Community is more than what we get. It's who we are. It's who we are. But I think many of us really struggle with community because the choice requires timing. Kairos, our ministry, is uh, the word time in Greek, but it's not the word time as in like, what time is it? You know, like, is it 7 o'clock? Is it 7.30? The word kairos in Greek has the idea with it that it's a timing. It's God's timing. It's the same kind of idea like when it, uh, of time when it means like what it means to hit a, a baseball. When somebody's throwing a baseball and you hit it just right. You're right on time. You, you drive that ball out of the park. Or the moment where you lean in for that first kiss. Like, there's definitely not a time to do that, right? We all know that. It's like, okay, that was the wrong time. Or the right time to, to start something new or fresh in your life. But many of us, when we think about community, we think that the timing has to be perfect for my life and my schedule and what I'm doing and the right people for me to say yes to it. Let's be honest, sometimes we don't choose community because we feel like we don't have enough time or the time isn't right or I don't know the right people. If I could find the right perfect community, then I would do it. But here's what I need you to hear is that there's never a perfect time on man's timetable to find community. You'll always find an excuse. But on God's timetable, the time is always now. When's the right time to find community? Today. Here's the deal. Jesus, if he was making his group of people, there are a group of people he probably would have chosen over this crew, this messy group of fishermen and tax collectors and, and people who are trying to overthrow the government. Jesus probably would have loved to have his brothers, but they weren't in. He could have been like, I'm going to wait till James and Jude join me. But like, they never did until he was raised from the dead. There are other people Jesus invited into his community. People like the rich young ruler who said, no, I don't want to. Or, or Nicodemus who was invited by Jesus to follow him and he remained a follower in secret until Jesus was crucified. So Jesus could have been like, it's just not the right time. But what does the Son of God do when he says, I want to change the world? What was God's master plan? It was to start a community. Why? Because God has always lived in community. Father, Son, and Spirit, God's always been in community. And God's plan to change the world was not the miracles Jesus did or the sermons he did. It was simply being known and then unleashing those people on the world. He literally was like, I'm going to take a bunch of untrained people and wreck the empire with them because they'll know me. So as we think about community, my invitation to you is to choose it. No one can choose it for you. Jesus has chosen you. He's chosen you to be his. And you get the opportunity to choose him back by giving your life to him, trusting him with your life, and then getting connected to other people, to his body. Christianity was never meant to be a Lone Ranger experience. It's meant to be lived out in community. And you're doing it wrong if you're not in community yet. But if we're people who live like Jesus and want to be his followers and are part of his community, we need to do it like him. You know what he did? He chose it. 
Some of us are waiting for somebody to choose us. Like, choose me, choose me, choose me, choose me, please. And let me just tell you, it'll never happen if you wait for other people to choose you. You have to choose. You have to be proactive. You have to say, I'm going to be the community bringer. And that's the secret. The secret to community is a choice. It's a choice to be someone who's connected to others. And who says, I want to be in. Because here's the deal. There will never be a perfect time other than right now. I've, the day I started was simply the day I no longer put it off. And I said, I want to be like Jesus. I'm just going to open my life for others. It changed my life forever. Same thing is true for you. Will you choose community? You can do that by joining one of our groups, by coming back to Kairos, getting plugged in, by not just simply being someone who is here but belongs here. But let me tell you this, the most important decision is simply to say, I want to be a community maker. I want to create community just like the Creator did. And you can do that by looking at your friends saying, hey, let's just study the Bible together. How about that? How about we just meet and study? Maybe we can meet before Kairos or after Kairos or just pray together. Why? Because I am someone that needs it. And you do too. And together we can look a lot like Jesus. So 120 seconds is our time to just reflect on the sermon. And my invitation to you is to choose community. So I don't know what that looks like. Maybe it's making a list of people that you want to be close to. When I first became a Christian, man, I had a group of party buddies, man. We just like, just raise cane all the time, okay? I realized I could not have them as my community. So I made a list of the people that I knew were following Jesus. I said, I want to be friends with them. And I just said, I'm going to choose them. And I moved out, started living with these other guys. And that was probably the wisest decision I could make at the time. For some of you maybe need to make a list of people that you want to pursue. Some of them are farther down the road than you, some are not as far, but you see a hunger in them and you're like, man, I'm gonna choose them. For some of you, you need to make a choice. You're like, I'm gonna exchange one old community because we're also raising Cain and I need to find out people who are on mission. Maybe yeah, that's you. But it simply starts with a choice. Often the first choice might simply be what Jesus did where he began to pray. Start saying, God, who is it? Who is it? Who should I bring? Would you show me? And maybe that's you tonight. So let's start there. Let me just pray for us as we reflect. Jesus, author of community, creator, community between God and man, who made a way where there wasn't one. Jesus, would you create community in this gathering tonight? God, I know that a lot of us are hungry for community. We don't want just friends to hang out with. We want the real thing, and it's hard to find it. So we're looking for people to choose us. But tonight, I just pray that we would just give ourselves the permission to be the initiators. Give us courage to choose people and ally ourselves if we're all doing it. We'll find it. So as we just reflect, God, would you just give us clarity? Clarity. And bring us community. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray.